Welcome everyone to yet another Authors at Google talk. It is my distinct privilege today to host Dr. Ray Kurzweil and my good friend here, Peter Norvig from our Artificial Intelligence Group, former director of research at Google. So just to give you a little bit of context why I am hosting this talk, when I was a kid, and you know, like wrote my first lines of code in elementary school. I saw a tremendous potential in that toy that I was playing with. And I said to my, all of my friends, you know what? Oh, this, one of these days, this is going to be as smart as humans. We just have to work a lot at it. And they would say, ah, no, that's impossible. How, how can you say something like that? And you know, I really didn't have a good answer in those times. I was just a kid. But I told them, look, I mean, you know, like, it's all built of atoms, right? I mean, the CPUs in this thing, that's atoms, and our brains, that's atoms. So there's no theoretical impossibility for this to happen. Well, today I'm very happy to host two guys who can explain why this will happen in much more detail. Please welcome Dr. Ray Kurzweil to Google. I think it's redundant to uh, introduce Ray. You, you all know him as uh, an inventor, uh, author, uh, a futurist. And you know, there, there was a book a few years back that accused uh, Xerox Park of fumbling the future. And I would say to continue that metaphor, Ray has intercepted the future and returned it for a touchdown <laughs> multiple times. Uh, he's done it with the flatbed scanner, with OCR, with print-to-speech, text-to-speech, speech recognition, uh, uh, music synthesis, and, and so on and so on. Uh, I won't list all the honors, uh, but he's been recognized by uh, Presidents uh, Johnson, Clinton, and Reagan, uh, and by Bill Cullen. Uh, those of you who are younger, you'll have to Google that. Uh, but, but let me put it this way. Have you heard of Plato, Aristotle, Socrates? <laughs> Philosophers! And, and Ray is a philosopher too, but more importantly, foremost, he's an engineer. And when it comes to these tough questions of creating the mind, uh, philosophers are useful, but I'm putting my money on the engineers. So. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Peter. I, can you hear me back there? Uh, yeah. Uh, I agree with that. In fact, I decided I wanted to be, well, I called it an inventor when I was five. And uh, I had this conceit, I know what I'm going to be. And it kind of reflected my family philosophy that if you have the right ideas, you can overcome any problem. And I particularly like coming here. This is actually my third time uh, at uh, Authors at Google. I was here in 2005. I wouldn't exactly say Google was a young upstart at that time. It was, about, I think, about 4,000 people uh, did it in the, in the lunchroom uh, near here. Uh, uh, the spirit hasn't changed. I think you're about 10 times the size. So 40,000 is like the size of a small city. Uh, but you're still actually a startup compared to the opportunity because the world is increasingly based on knowledge and information. In fact, 65% of American workers are knowledge workers. So the mission of organizing and providing ac intelligent access to all the world's knowledge is the most important task in the world. And Google is clearly the leader in that. Uh, and there's tremendous potential because knowledge is growing exponentially. So I want to say a few words about exponential growth and my law of accelerating returns, which was the primary message of the singularity is near. Uh, but I think Google is actually a very good example of that exponential growth. I happened to be on Maura Gunn's Tech Nation NPR program yesterday, and she was uh, reminiscing about her 2001 interview with Larry and Sergi, who came in with dark suits and ties. And they were trying to explain this Google computer they were going to create, and she didn't quite understand what it was. And Larry said, well, it's going to be like Hal. And, uh, and then uh, Sergi said, but it won't kill you. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, so I think we got the second part of that. The first part of that 
we have in the sense that Google's pretty amazing in terms of finding information. I'm amazed by it every hour, but uh, I think we can go further in that direction. That's what I'd like to talk about. Uh, you all have these billions of pages and millions of books and you know, very good access to it, but there's a lot of information there that's reflected in the natural language ideas. And computers now, I think, can begin to understand those. And that's something I'm working on. That's something I talked about, I talk about in this book. And I'd like to share that idea with you. Uh, first, I'll say a few words about the law of accelerating returns. I mentioned I decided to be an inventor when I was five. I realized 30 years ago that the key to being successful is timing. Uh, those inventors whose names you know are the ones that got the timing right. So Larry and Sergey had this great idea about reverse engineering the links on the internet to provide a better search engine, but they did it at exactly the right time. And so in 1981, I was thinking, uh, my project has to make sense when I finish the project, and the world will be a different place two, three, four years from now. That was even true in 81. It's even more true today. Acceleration is another feature of the law of accelerating returns. Our first communication technology, spoken language, took hundreds of thousands of years to develop. Uh, then people saw that stories were drifting. People didn't always retell this, the story in the same way, so we need some record of it. So we invented written language that took tens of thousands of years. Then we needed more efficient ways of producing written language. The printing press uh, actually took 400 years to reach a mass audience. I gave a speech at the University of Basel recently on the occasion of its 550th anniversary. It was founded 20 years after Gutenberg's invention, right near the spot where he invented it. And I said, wow, you must have had some of his books when you opened your doors. And they said, yes, we got them very quickly. It was only a century later. I mean, that, you know, that was the Google of, of that time. Uh, it took maybe a century to find the right information, so you didn't really find it in your lifetime. It took 400 years for that really to reach an uh, appreciable number of people. The telephone reached 25% of the U.S. population in 50 years. Uh, the cell phone did that in seven years. Social networks, wikis, blogs took about three years. Go back three or four years ago, most people didn't use social networks, wikis and blogs. Ten years ago, most people didn't use search engines. That sounds like ancient history, but it wasn't so long ago. And then we very quickly become dependent on these brain extenders. I mean, during that one-day SOPA strike, I felt like a part of my brain had gone on strike. <laughs> and because uh, there was a way around it. Uh, but I didn't know that until the day came. And uh, so I, I really felt like I'm going to lose part of my mind. Uh, yet this was not technology that I had even a few years earlier. Uh, what's driving this is the exponential growth of information technology. In 1981, I began to look at data, uh, being an engineer. And, but I, ha I started out with the common wisdom that you cannot predict the future. And that remains true as to which company, which standard will succeed. But if you measure the underlying properties of information technology, the first one I looked at, and a classical one, the power of computation per constant dollar, so calculations per second per constant dollar, uh, or the number of bits we're moving around wirelessly, or the number of bits on the internet, or the cost of transmitting a bit, or the spatial resolution of brain scanning, or the amount of data we're downloading about the brain, or the cost of sequencing a base pair of DNA, or a genome, or the no amount of genetic data we're sequencing. I mean, these fundamental measures follow amazingly predictable trajectories, uh, really belying the common wisdom that you cannot predict the future. And what's predictable is that they grow exponentially. And that is not intuitive. Our intuition about the future is that it's linear, not exponential. If you ever wondered, why do I have a brain? It's really to predict the future. So we could predict the consequences of our actions and inactions. So I'm walking along and okay, that animal's going that way towards the rock and I'm going this way, we're gonna meet about in about 20 seconds up at that rock, I think I'll go a different way. That proved to be useful for survival, that became hardwired in our brains. Those predictors of the future are linear and they work very well for the kinds of situations we encountered when our brains evolved a thousand years ago. It's not appropriate for the progression of information technology 
and I'd say the principal difference between myself and my critics is they look at the current situation and they make linear extrapolations. So halfway through the genome project, seven years, 1% had been completed, and mainstream uh, scientists who were still skeptical said, I told you this wasn't going to work. Seven years, 1% is going to take 700 years, like we said. My reaction was, no, we're almost done. I mean, uh, I mean 1%. You're pretty much finished. I mean, that's. Um, you, can, you can try that with uh, your product submission uh, schedules. Uh, but it, the next, it had been doubling every year. There was reason to believe that would continue. Uh, it was only seven doublings from 100%. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. It kept doubling. It was finished seven years later. That has continued uh, up to the present day. The first genome cost a billion dollars. We're now down to under 10,000, uh, and so on. Uh, and it's true in every area of information technology. Not everything, I mean, transportation's not yet an information technology, but industries are converting. It's not just the gadgets we carry around. Health and medicine has become an information technology. I'll talk about that. The world of physical things is going to become an information technology as three-dimensional printing gets going, and I'll touch on that. Uh, it's worth just examining for a moment the difference between linear progressions, which is our intuition, and the reality of information technology, which is exponential. So linear goes one, two, three, four. Exponential, which is information technology, goes two, four, eight, sixteen. Is that really so different? Actually, it's not that different. A linear progression is a good approximation of an exponential one for a short period of time. I mean, look at an exponential. Take a little piece of it. It looks like a straight line. It's a very bad estimate over a long period of time. At step 30, the linear progression's at 30. Uh, at step 30, the exponential progression's at a billion. And that's not an idle speculation about the future. This Android phone is several billion times more powerful per constant dollar than the computer I used as an undergraduate. It's a million times cheaper, it's several thousand times more powerful in terms of computation, communication, memory, and so on. And it's also 100,000 times smaller, that's another exponential progression. And we'll do both of those things again in the next 25 years. So that gives you some idea of what will be feasible. So this is what I wanted to cover. Uh, any questions on any of this? Uh, uh, well, this was the first graph I had. Uh, in 1981, so I don't know if you can see that, but uh, I had it through 1980. And this is calculations per second per constant dollar. It's a logarithmic scale, which I have to take some pains to explain to many audiences, but every point on this, uh, labeled point on this y-axis is 100,000 times greater than the level below it. So this modest little uptick is a, represents trillions fold increase in the amount of computer you can get per constant dollar uh, over the last century, going back to the 1890 census. Several billion fold just since I was a student. And people go, oh, Moore's Law. But Moore's Law is actually just the part on the right that had actually only been underway for a little over a decade when I did this uh, estimate. Uh, this started decades before Gordon Moore was even born. 1950s, they were shrinking vacuum tubes, making them smaller and smaller to keep this exponential growth going. CBS predicted the election of Eisenhower with a vacuum tube-based computer in 1952. Rem remember that? <laughs> uh, a few people here might remember it. But um, When I first talked to Google in 2005, I don't think anybody remembered it. Uh, but finally, that hit a wall. It couldn't shrink the vacuum tubes anymore and keep the vacuum, and that was the end of that paradigm, but it was not the end of the ongoing exponential, it just went to the fourth paradigm. And people have been talking about the end of Moore's Law, but the sixth paradigm will be three-dimensional computing. We've taken baby steps in that direction. Um, if you talk to Justin Ratner, the CTO of Intel, he'll show you uh, these experimental circuits they have that are three-dimensional, self-organizing molecular circuits. Those will become practical in the teen years before we run out of steam with flat integrated circuits, which is what Moore's Law is all about. But the, the most interesting thing about this is just look at how smooth and predictable a trajectory that is. People say, well, it must have slowed down during the Great Depression or the recent recession, neither of which is the case. Did Google slow down during the recent recession? Um, 
I mean, these technologies continue because we're creating the computers and the systems and the search engines of 2013 and 2014 with the computers of 2012. We couldn't do that in 2002. We didn't. We had computers of 2002, so we created the systems of 2003. That's why the technology builds on itself. Uh, but it, it goes through thick and thin, through war and peace, through boom times and recessions. Nothing seems to affect it. And we can talk about natural limits, but I examine that in the singularity is near. And if you look at what we know about the physics of computing, the amount of, we do need a certain amount of matter and energy to compute, to remember, to transmit a bit. But it's very, very small. And based on the limits that we understand that have been demonstrated, we can go well into the century and develop systems that are many trillions of times more powerful than we have today. So I don't dwell on these examples of electronics, but you could buy one transistor for a dollar in 1968. And I, I thought that was actually pretty cool at the time because uh, in the early 60s, I would hang out at the surplus electronic shops on Canal Street in New York, and they're still there. And buy something this big, a telephone really, they could switch one bit for $50. And it was big and slow, 30 millisecond reset time. Uh, and I can actually get something much faster and smaller for a dollar. Today you can get billions for a dollar, and they're better, again, because they're smaller, so the electrons have less distance to travel. Cost per transistor cycle is coming down by half every year. That's a measure of price performance. So the fact that you can buy an Android phone that's twice as good as the one two years ago for half the price, partly is because Google is clever, but partly it's because of this law of accelerating returns. That's a 50% deflation rate. And we put some of that price performance improvement into better performance and some of it into lower prices. So you get better products for lower cost. Uh, and that's going to continue for a very long time. The, the economists actually worry about deflation. We had massive deflation during the Depression. Uh, that was a different source. It was not price performance improvement. It was a collapse of consumer confidence. But they're still concerned as more and more of the economy becomes information technology, like all of health and medicine. Uh, Peter's working on education becoming an information technology. And if you can get the same stuff, computes, uh, bits of communication, base pairs of DNA, physical things printed out in three-dimensional printers, for half the cost of a year ago, Economics 101 will say that you will buy more. But you're not going to double your consumption year after year, because after all, how much do you need? You'll reach a saturation point, so maybe you'll increase your consumption 50%. And so the, the size of the economy of these information technologies will shrink, not as measured in bits, bytes, and base pairs, but as measured in constant currency. Uh, and for a variety of good reasons, that would not be a good thing. And that is not what is happening. In fact, we more than double our consumption. Uh, each year. Uh, this, this is bits shift, but I have 50 other consumption graphs like this. We, the, uh, every form of information technology has had a, an average growth rate of 18% per year for the last 50 years in currency, despite the fact that you can get twice as much of it each year for the same price. And the reason for that is certain, as so we reach certain points of price performance, whole new applications explode. I mean, search engines like we have now, or even that, like we had 10 years ago, weren't feasible 20 years ago. And search engines, there were search engines before three or four years ago, but they didn't take off because they weren't even able to upload one picture. And when the price performance reached a certain point, uh, these applications exploded. And we have an insatiable appetite for information, for knowledge, which is really information that has been shaped by meaning. Uh, that's, that's the mission of Google, is to turn information into knowledge that people can access and benefit from. So Time Magazine had a cover story on my law of accelerating returns. I wanted to put a particular computer uh, they had covered and were fond of on the chart. I said, well, I don't know. You know it might be below the chart, because sometimes people come out with things that are not cost effective, and then they don't last in the marketplace. This has just come out. But it actually was on the curve. It's the last point there. And this is a curve I laid out 30 years ago. I laid it out through 2050. But we're right where we should be. Uh, this has been an amazingly predictable phenomenon. Communication technology. 
Co uh, Martin Cooper, uh, one of the faculty at Singularity University. Uh, he invented a product that uh, you sell, uh, the mobile phone, and uh, that's the amount of, number of bits of data we send around wirelessly in the world. So it's over the last century. A century ago, this was Morse code over AM radio. Today, it's 4G networks. But it, and again, this is trillions-fold increase. That's a logarithmic scale. Uh, but look at how smooth a progression that is. Uh, internet data traffic. This is a graph I had just the first few points of in the early 80s. It was the ARPANET. And I said, wow, this is going to be a World Wide Web connecting hundreds of millions of people to each other and to vast knowledge resources by the late 90s. And I wrote that in the 80s. And people thought that was ridiculous when the entire defense budget could only tie together a few thousand scientists. Uh, but that's the power of exponential growth. That is what happened. Uh, that's the same data on the right seen on a linear scale. That's how we experience the world. So the casual observer, it looked like, whoa, the World Wide Web's new thing came out of nowhere but you could see it coming. And you can see revolutions coming if you look at these progressions. And that is what I advise young companies to do, because I get some business plans and do some mentoring. And uh, very often, these plans talk about the world three, four years from now, like nothing is going to change. And you only have to look at the last three, four years to see that that's not correct. Uh, I could talk for a long time about this phenomenon. Uh, but we are turning health and medicine into an information technology. Uh, I mentioned the Genome Project, but uh, we can actually reprogram this outdated software in our bodies. How long do you go without updating your Android phone software? This is probably updating itself right now. Uh, but I'm still walking around with software in my body that evolved thousands of years ago, like, for example, the fat insulin receptor gene which says, hold on to every calorie because the next hunting season may not work out so well. That was a good idea a thousand years ago. You worked all day to get a few calories. There were no refrigerators, so you stored them in your fat cells. I'd like to tell my fat insulin receptor gene, you don't need to do that anymore. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm confident the next hunting season will be good at the, at, uh, at, at the supermarket. Uh, so that was actually tried in animal experiments. We have a number of ways of turning genes off, like RNA interference. Uh, and these animals ate ravenously and remained slim and got the health benefits of caloric restriction while doing the opposite. They lived 20% longer. Uh, they're working with a drug company to bring that to the human market. Uh, I'm on the board of a company that takes lung cells out of the body of patients who have a disease caused by a missing gene. So if you're missing this gene, you probably will get this terminal disease, pulmonary hypertension. Uh, so they take, they scrape out lung cells from the throat, add a gene in vitro, um, and then expect it got done correctly, replicate the cell several million fold, that's another new technology, inject it back in the body, goes through the bloodstream, the body recognizes them as lung cells, you've now added millions of cells with that patient's DNA, but with the gene they're missing, and this is actually cured this disease in, in successful human trials, and it's doing a phase three trial now uh, before it gets approved. There are hundreds of examples of reprogramming our biology. My, my father had a heart attack in 1961, damaged his heart, which is the case of 50% of all heart attack survivors have a damaged heart, and he could hardly walk. He died of that in 1970. Uh, up until re very recently, there's nothing you could do about it because the heart does not rejuvenate itself naturally. You can now reprogram stem cells to rejuvenate the heart. And I've talked to people who could hardly walk, and now they're normal. Uh, we, are re we are growing organs already. Some of these are being, simpler organs are being used in humans. Uh, other ones are now being implanted in, uh, in animals, uh, where we lay down the scaffold with three-dimensional printers and then use the three-dimensional printer to populate it with stem cells and regrow, for example, a kidney. Uh, so all of this is coming. It's a complex area, but the point is that health and medicine has become an information technology, and therefore it's subject to this law of accelerating returns. So these technologies, which are already uh, beginning to enter clinical practice, are going to be a thousand times more powerful in 10 years, a million times more powerful 
in 20 years. It gives you some idea of what's coming. Uh, if I want to send you a music album or a movie or a book, a few, just a few years ago I'd send you a FedEx package. I can now send you a, a Gmail message and with those products as an attachment. I can also send you these musical instruments if you have the three-dimensional printer. Uh, and this is a revolution right before the storm. The pr they've been expensive. They were hundreds of thousands of dollars and tens, now thousands. Uh, th they will in a number of years go sub-thousand. The resolution is improving at a rate of about 103D volume per decade. It's still over several microns, needs to be sub-micron. The range of materials is increasing. Uh, ultimately, a, very, a, a substantial fraction of manufacturing uh, will be done this way, turning uh, information files into physical products. Today, you can print out 70% of the parts you need with your three-dimensional printer to create another three-dimensional printer. And <laughs> that, that will be 100% in, in five to eight years. So that brings me to the brain, and I want to uh, spend some time on that. I've been thinking about this topic for 50 years, actually, thinking about thinking. I wrote a paper in uh, when I was 14, that's 50 years ago, um, that uh, basically described the human brain as a large number of pattern recognizers. And that was my Westinghouse Science Town Search submission, and I got to meet President Johnson, and I did a program that looked for, did pattern recognition on musical melodies and then wrote original music with the patterns it had discovered. So you could feed in Chopin and it would write then music like it was a student of Chopin or Mozart and you could recognize which composer had been analyzed uh, with the original music that it was composing. And uh, this book ac actually articulates a very consistent uh, thesis. Uh, pattern recognition is what we do well uh, we're not very good at logical thinking. Uh, computers do a far better job of that. One of the predictions I made in the early 80s is that by 97, actually I said 98, the computer would take the World Chess Championship. I also predicted that when that happened, we would immediately dismiss chess as being of any significance. <laughs> uh, both of those things happened in 97 when Deep Blue defeated Kasparov. And people say, well, of course that's true. You know, chess is a logic game and computers are logic machines. So we'd expect them to do a better job than humans on chess. But what they will never do is be able to understand the vagaries and subtleties and ambiguities of human language. So already we're seeing that being overturned. And there's this actually a pretty impressive range. It's a, just a first step, but an impressive range of language that you can say to systems like Google Now, and it will understand you pretty well and actually begin to d develop a model of who you are, uh, something that Siri doesn't do. Um, how, how many of you can answer this Jeopardy question? A, a long, tiresome speech delivered by a frothy pie topping. Uh, what is a meringue harangue? Um, <laughs> So Watson got that correct. The, the two humans who are the best human Jeopardy players ever uh, did not get it. Um, and Watson got a higher score than the best two humans uh, put together. Um, and there's a lot of misunderstandings about Watson. People say, well, it's not really doing any true understanding of language because it's just doing statistical analysis of, of words. Uh, actually, what it does, I mean, it actually has many different modules. What the, uh, what the IBM engineers did is create a framework called UMA, uh, which runs these different systems and is able to analyze their strengths and weaknesses and combine them. Uh, so actually, the engineers in charge of Watson don't actually un necessarily understand all of those modules. The ones I think that are most effective are ones that are statistical, but they're not just doing statistics on word sequences. They're building a hierarchical model with a whole field of probabilities at different levels of the hierarchy. Uh, and if that does not represent a true understanding of the material, then humans have no true understanding either because that is how the neocortex works. And another misconception is that every fact was sort of programmed in some language like Lisp. 
In fact, Watson got its knowledge by reading Wikipedia and several other encyclopedias, 200 million pages of natural language documents. And it is true that it actually doesn't do as good a job on any page uh, as a human. So you could read a page, and if you knew nothing about the presidency, you can conclude, wow, uh, Barack Obama, there's a 95% chance Barack Obama is president, having read that one page. And Watson will read it and come out with the conclusion, no, oh, there's 58% chance that Barack Obama is president. So it didn't do as good a job of understanding that page. But it has read 200 million pages, and you know, maybe 100,000 of those have to do with Barack Obama being president. And it can, it can then combine all those probabilities using sound probability theory, uh, Bayes' theorem, and so on, and conclude that there's a 99.99% .99 chance that Barack Obama is president. Uh, it, it can, has total recall of those 200 million pages and can analyze the cross implications in three seconds. It's just a first step, but that is, that is the kind of capability that we're leading to. My vision of search engines uh, in the not too distant future is that they won't wait to be asked questions. They'll be listening in on our conversations, what we say, what we write, what we read, what we hear, uh, if you let them, and I believe people will, because it will be useful to have an intelligent assistant like this, and it will anticipate your needs. So suddenly it might pop up and say, well, just yesterday you were talking about uh, if only we could make, have better bioavailable means of phosphatidylcholine. And, well, here's a study that came out 36 minutes ago on just that topic. And, if it sees you're struggling in a conversation uh, to come up with the name of that actress, you know, right in your field of view, on your Google Glass, uh, you'll, you'll get information about that actress, not even having asked for it. It can just see you needed that. Uh, obviously, that could be annoying. If it's really information you don't want, <laughs> that'll be the key. Uh, but actually, we, we very much want this information. I mean, people are constantly you know, Googling something at dinner, uh, but we don't even want to have to put that information in if an intelligent assistant should be listening to what we say. So, some of the best evidence for the thesis I've come up with on how the neocortex works has emerged just, just as I was sending off the book. Actually, four times I had to, was about to send it to the publisher and said, no, wait, it's, this great research just came out. I've got to include this. Uh, and we actually delayed the book as a result. The publisher wasn't happy with that, but uh, these were great uh, pieces of research to support the thesis. The thesis is, is that uh, there are modules in the brain uh, that are comprised about 100 neurons, uh, and that each one of these recognizes a pattern and is capable of wiring itself literally with a wire biological wire, an axon and a dendrite, to other modules to create this hierarchy that, that the neocortex represents. And that hierarchy doesn't exist when the brain is created. Uh, even before we're born, we start, we start building this one conceptual layer at a time. Uh, and that's actually the secret of human thought, the ability to, to build these modules. One piece of research uh, of the, that I that came out just as I was sending off the book, is that there are, the neocortex is comprised of these modules of about 100 neurons. The wiring and structure of those 100 neurons is not plastic. It's stable throughout life. It is the connections between these modules, uh, which are dynamic and plastic and are created, and that our brain, our neocortex creates our thoughts, but our thoughts create our brain in terms of these connections and the patterns that each module learns. This is different from neural nets, and I've never been a fan of neural nets. I've I pioneered, was one of the pioneers of hierarchical hidden Markov models in the 80s and 90s and used that for speech recognition, and today that is the dominant technique in speech recognition, speech synthesis, character recognition. It's one of the popular techniques in natural language understanding, and it's really the closest mathematical equivalent to what I'm talking about. This 100 neuron module is more complex than one neuron in a neural net. It's capable of learn dynamically learning a pattern, recognizing the pattern even if parts of it are occluded or missing. Uh, it can actually tell other pattern recognizers to expect a pattern because 
uh, it can see that it's almost recognized a pattern and another part's coming, and so lower level pattern recognizers should be alert for that. Uh, it, it's capable of creating these connections up and down the hierarchy. Uh, and that's much more complex than one neuron in a neural net. So the neural net is based on one neuron, either a model of it that we have in synthetic neural nets or uh, in theory, uh, the neural net that the brain represents. And that's not uh, the right building block, either for AI or, or for, the, for the brain. Uh, there was this recent research at Google that showed a ability to do image recognition uh, with a neural net and uh, without any uh, labeling of the data. Uh, it was uh, impressive, but, uh, but it's only recognized 15% accuracy. Uh, I think a much better model is based on these, uh, not having the neuron as the building block. The building block are these modules. And we have about 30 billion neurons in the neocortex. That's about 300 million of these pattern recognizers. Now, a word about the neocortex. It is this part of the brain where we do hierarchical thinking. It can think in hierarchies, and it can solve problems in hierarchies. And it can see a solution to a problem and then reapply it in situations that might be a little different. So, and only mammals have a neocortex. So 100 million years ago, these mammals emerged. Uh, rodent-like creatures with a neocortex that was the size of a postage stamp, about as thin as a postage stamp, uh, flat and smooth, and it covered the brain. But it was capable of a certain amount of, of this hierarchical thinking. So these uh, mammals could solve problems uh, quickly, or it could want see another member of its species solve a problem and learn it in a matter of hours. Uh, animal species without a neocortex could learn too, but not in the course of one lifetime. They had pre-programmed behaviors. Those behaviors could evolve in biological evolution, but that would take thousands of lifetimes. So over thousands or tens of thousands of years, they could gradually change their behavior. And that was okay because the environment changed that slowly. So there would be environmental changes that required an accommodation in behavior over thousands of years. But then, 65 million years ago, there was a cataclysmic event that happened very quickly called the Cretaceous Extinction Event. And we see archaeological evidence of that around the globe. There's a layer that represents this catastrophic change in the environment that happened very quickly. And there are theories about that having to do with the meteor, but it's very clear that, that there was a sudden change in the environment at that time. And the animals that didn't have a neocortex and that couldn't adjust quickly, uh, thousands of those species died out. That's when the mammals uh, took over that, their ecological niche of, of small and medium-sized animals. And the, uh, so to anthropomorphize, biological evolution said, wow, this uh, neocortex is a pretty good, pretty good design. And, and it kept growing it in size. Uh, Add through uh, increasingly complex mammal uh, species. By the time we got to primates, it's no longer sm a smooth sheet. It's got all these convolutions and ridges to increase its surface area. It's still a flat structure. If you take a human neocortex, you can stretch it out into a flat structure the size of a large table napkin. It's about the same thickness. It's still thin. But it has so many convolutions and ridges, it actually comprises 80% of the brain. And that's where we do our uh, hierarchical thinking. So if you take a primate, it also has one with convolutions and ridges. But the innovation in Homo sapiens is we have this large forehead to squeeze in more of this neocortex. And that greater quantity uh, was the enabling factor for the qualitative leap we had of being able to make inventions, like language and art and science and, and Nexus phones. Uh, <laughs> so. How does this work? Well, for one thing, our ability to actually see inside the brain and confirm uh, these types of insights are growing exponentially. Different types of uh, brain scanning are growing at an exponential rate. We can now see your brain create your thoughts. We can see your thoughts create your brain. Uh, we can see individual interneural connections forming in real time. And 
Another piece of research that came out just as I was sending off the book is that at the beginning of life, there is this very uniform wiring of the neocortex of connection, basically connections in waiting. So you have one pattern recognizer, and it wants to connect itself, let's say, to one at a higher conceptual level. It has to actually connect a wire. It actually finds there's actually a grid there of like avenues and streets in Manhattan, and it finds the right avenue and the right street and then makes the final connections. And we can actually see that process uh, in real time now uh, inside a living brain. And then actually uh, finalizes that, that connection. And then the connections that are never used die away. About half of the connections that exist in a newborn actually go away by the time you're two years old. So to take a simplified example of how this works, uh, these pattern recognizers learn patterns. And they're at different levels of the conceptual hierarchy. And there's a lot of redundancy, which is one way it deals with uncertainty, and one way it can deal with variant variations in patterns. So I have a bunch of pattern recognizers that are, have learned to recognize a crossbar and a capital A, and that's all they care about, uh, you know, some exciting new technology or a pretty girl could walk by, it doesn't care. It, it, uh, it just, but it, when it sees a crossbar and a capital A, it goes, whoa, crossbar, and it, uh, <laughs> and it sends up a signal, I believe this is not on or off, it's a probable, it's the, the whole system is a network of probabilities, but it says there's, there's a high probability we have a crossbar here. At that next higher level, it's getting different inputs, and it might then fire with a high probability, ah, capital A. And at a higher level, a pattern recognizer might think, hmm, there's a very good probability that the word of Apple uh, is printed here. Uh, and another part of the visual cortex, uh, a pattern recognizer might go, oh, an actual physical Apple. And in another region, uh, a pattern recognizer might go, uh, oh, someone just said the word Apple go up a number of levels further where you're now getting input at a higher level of conceptual hierarchy, so it's connected to multiple senses. It may see a certain fabric, smell a certain perfume, hear a certain voice, and so my wife has entered the room. At a much higher level, there are pattern recognizers that go, oh, that was funny, uh, that was ironic, she's pretty. Uh, those are actually no more complicated but they, except for the fact that they exist at this very high level of the conceptual hierarchy. I talk about in the book this uh, brain surgery of a young girl. She was conscious, which you can be in brain surgery because there's no pain receptors in the brain. And whenever they stimulated a particular point in her neocortex, she would laugh. And they thought they were triggering a laugh reflex, but they quickly discovered, no, they're triggering the perception of humor. She just found everything hilarious when they triggered that <laughs> spot. You guys are so funny standing there. It was a typical comment, but only when they were triggering that spot. And these guys weren't funny, so. Uh, so uh, they had found one spot, uh, and we obviously have many of them, but they had found one that w represented the perception of humor. Where does this hierarchy come from? Well, we're not born with it, obviously. That's what we're creating from the moment we're born, or even before that. I have a one-year-old grandson now, and he's, he's He's laid down several layers. We can lay down really one conceptual layer at a time. Um, and we run through the 300 million. One of the reasons children can learn, say, a new language so easily is that they have all this virgin neocortex. By the time we're 20, it's really filled up. Uh, that doesn't mean we can't learn new things. We have to forget something to learn something new. We don't necessarily have to completely forget it because there's a lot of redundancy. And when we're first starting to learn something, there's lots of redundancy, and a lot of the patterns are imperfect. And over time, we can actually perfect that model and have less redundancy and still have a good recognition. And so we can free up uh, neocortical recognizers for, some, for, some, for a new subject. But some people are better at that than others. I mean, the rigidity that some people have in learning a new idea is reflected in this uh, ability or inability to, to learn new material. Um, now, 300 million, a lot or a little. Uh, it was a lot compared to other primates, which have, who have somewhat less. 
And that was the enabling factor for science and art and music and language and so on. Um, but it's also a big limitation if you recognize uh, the limitations we have in learning new knowledge. We ultimately will be able to expand the neocortex. So I'm working now on synthetic neocortexes, not f in the near future for, to be connect, directly connected to the brain, but I think if you go out to the 2030s, we will be able to do that. And we actually don't have to put them inside the brain, we just have to put the gateways uh, to it in the brain. If I do something interesting on this, do a search, do a language translation, ask Google Now a question, uh, it doesn't take place in this rectangular box. It goes out to the cloud. And uh, if I suddenly need 1,000 processors or 10,000 for a tenth of a second, uh, the cloud provides that. To, to the limits of the law of accelerating returns at that point in time, ultimately we'll be able to do that with the brain and have more than 300 million panel recognizers that run faster, that can be backed up. Um, and that's where we're headed. We'll have a greater quantity. The last time we added a greater quantity, we got this qualitative leap of creating art, science, and language, and uh, we'll be able to make another qualitative leap with that expansion. Uh, already these devices represent brain expanders, uh, but we'll have much more powerful means of doing that. So, uh, just a few comments. Uh, Peter will appreciate this, but uh, we are destroying jobs at the bottom of the skill ladder, adding new jobs at the top, so we're investing more in education. Uh, we spend 10 times as much on K through 12 per capita uh, in constant dollars compared to a century ago. Uh, we had 50,000 college students in 1870. We have 12 million today. There's a big revolution coming, which Peter can tell you about in higher education, fostered by this tremendous boon in both intelligent computation and communication. Um, we've tripled the amount of education a child gets in the developing world, doubled it in the developed world over the last half century. Uh, Larry Page and I actually worked on a major energy study for the National Academy of Engineering, uh, and the costs of solar energy both uh, PPV and total installed costs are coming down. As a result, the total amount of solar energy is, is on an exponential climb. It's doubling every two years. Right now it's 1%. So people go, oh, 1%, that's a fringe player. It's kind of a nice thing to do, but it's not really significant. Uh, just the way they dismiss the internet or the genome projects when they, when they were 1% of a usable uh, corpus of users. Uh, it's only seven doublings at two years each uh, from 100%. Uh, this was adopted by the National Academy of Engineering. I presented it recently to the Prime Minister of Israel, and he was in my class at the Sloan School in the 70s, and he said, Ray, do we have enough sunlight to do this with? And I said, yes, we have 10,000 times more than we need. After we double seven more times, we'll be using one part in 10,000. So there's a whole other discussion about resources in general. We're running out of resources if we limit ourselves to 19th century first industrial revolution technologies like fossil fuels. Uh, but in terms of water, energy, food with uh, vertical agriculture, another looming revolution coming over the next decade, uh, we actually will have a lot of resources. So this is the progress we've made uh, in longevity over the last thousand years. We've quadrupled life expectancy. It's doubled in the last 200 years. Uh, and this is from the linear progression of health and medicine. Uh, it's now become an information technology. Uh, this will go into high gear uh, once we uh, really master these techniques of biotechnology. There's many revolutions coming, but the most important one is that what's unique about the human species is that we have knowledge. And there's many different ways to measure knowledge, but each way, no matter how you look at it, it's growing exponentially. So we're doubling the amount of knowledge at, by some measures, every, say, every 13 months. Uh, and that's actually what's hard to do. We have m much better means already of finding knowledge with Google and, and other tools. Uh, that's going to get more and more powerful. Uh, but we need that added intelligence in order to actually continue this exponential growth of information technology. So Google is still very well positioned 
to, uh, for fantastic growth and importance and, and success over the next uh, several decades. Thank you very much. Thank you, Al. We'll do a Q&A, and please use the audience microphone. Hi, uh, my name is Jason. I actually work in PR, so I think a lot about perceptions of this kind of progress. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking about how people have a, a tremendous tendency to sort of take for granted whatever the next progression is, or to sort of underestimate the, to, to correct for whatever improvements there are. Um, do you, what do you think about that? The fact that you, you see sort of in, you know, if you measure all these things, and, and I'm thinking of Steven Pinker's work on violence dropping over time as well. Um, people tend to sort of correct for that and take it for granted and say, well, you know, dismiss it at each, at each stage. Do you think that is just sort the of built into us? People have an amazing ability to accept new changes and, and then assume that the world's always been that way. If you, just, if you describe self-driving cars a decade ago, people would dismiss that as science fiction. Now that we have it, people shrug, well, it's not in everybody's hands, but actually I've talked to people who've driven in the Google cars. They quickly actually gain more confidence in the AI driver than a human driver. Maybe that's not saying much, but uh, <laughs> uh, people very quickly then take it for granted. Um, and there is, I travel around the world. I don't get that here in Silicon Valley, but as I go to other parts in the world, there's a common perception that the world's getting worse. And a, a big subset of that a school of thought is that technology is responsible for it. I'd like to show them this graph. Uh, so this is the world in 1800. Uh, and these are countries. Uh, this is on the y, the x-axis is the wealth of nations, income per person. Uh, on the y-axis is life expectancy. Uh, and over the last 200 years, there's been dramatic improvement in both. A uh, little bit of movement in the first industrial revolution, but as you get to the 20th century, there's a wind that carries all these nations towards the upper right-hand corner of the graph. Uh, and there's still a have-have-not divide, but the countries that are worst off at the end of the process are far better off than the countries that were best off at the beginning. And I shouldn't say end of the process, because the process actually is going to go into high gear as we get to the more mature phases of AI and three-dimensional printing and biotechnology and so on. Uh, but people forget that what the world was like three or four years ago before we had social networks and wikis and blogs. And, uh, you know, during that SOPA strike, people were shocked that they could have to do without these brain extenders, uh, which we didn't have just a few years ago. So yes, the w people take changes for granted, uh, but also they re very readily adopt them. You describe the world 20, 30 years from now, and people say, well, I don't know if I want to opt in for that. It doesn't happen that way. It happens you know, through thousands of product announcements and research advances. And, but when there's a somewhat better treatment for cancer, there's no philosophical discussion, is it really a good thing to extend longevity? People adopt it and celebrate it if it works. Um, so we, we will continue to make this kind of progress, and I think it's a moral imperative that we do. Uh, there, are, there are downsides, that's a whole other discussion, but overall, as you can see, life is, is continuing to get better uh, in all the ways that we can measure, health, wealth, education, and so on. You mentioned one of the great innovations of uh, the humans is having uh, a lot more space up there uh, for neocortex. What about uh, our, some of our earthmates like whales? They've got, they've got a lot more space up there. Right. Um, there are some other animals. Uh, actually, the whale brain is bigger. Uh, we have one other enabling factor, which is this opposable appendage which enable us to, to take our ideas and our visions and, wow, I could take that, that branch and I could strip it of the leaves and I could put a point on it and I could create this tool. And then we had the opposable appendage 
to do that. And then we had the tool to create other tools. And uh, these other species don't have that, that opposable appendage. I mean, we see some clumsy ability to move things around, say, by an elephant, which also has a big brain. Um, but uh, it's actually not clear that the neocortex specifically is bigger in a whale. But it's, it's pretty comparable. Uh, they don't have this uh, opposable appendage that enabled us. So those two things enable us to create technology. And technology has reshaped the world. So. But then what about sort of deep thought as opposed to just being able to shape the world, right? So taking it on a slightly different vector. Well, it depends what you mean by deep thought. I mean, the fact that we can develop these more, these greater number of levels of abstraction uh, the neocortex in most other mammals is really devoted to, you know, the challenges of being a raccoon or whatever. And uh, we've been able to actually then create these abstract levels. So we still have the old brain. And so we, uh, the neocortex is a great sublimator and it can take the uh, sex and aggression of the old brain and uh, convert it into poetry and music, and that, that then becomes a, an end in itself. Uh, and we've really been the only species to master these additional levels, which, which you would consider deep thought. But it, it's an, an ex extension of the neocortical hierarchy. It seems pretty clear that the, the size of the pie for 3D printing is, is growing significantly, such that like I've already made a couple of investments in that market. And I'm wondering if, based on your research, you've identified any other uh, markets where you see the size of the pie growing so much, where sort of if you, if you make a broad play across the industry, that, uh, that it's nearly guaranteed to grow. I, th uh, <laughs> uh, I think search is very well positioned. And, uh, <laughs> Even though, even though it may seem to be saturated, its role in our lives is not, because uh, search is going to, be, to become much more intelligent. Our knowledge base is continuing to expand, and, and we can really use this as an intelligent assistant to help guide us to, to actually help us solve problems and be more of an assistant uh, as we make uh, search more intelligent. Uh, and it's not just the way we traditionally think of search. It's this whole world of knowledge. And you know, Google is very much committed to uh, knowledge in all of its different forms and then finding intelligent ways to find that information and use it. And so that's very well positioned. Uh, virtual reality is going to become a big deal. Uh, Google has an interest in that. The Project Glass, Google Glass, is a, uh, will be a first step. But ultimately, I mean, you, you know, this is it's actually, I like the big screen, but it's actually it's still pretty little. It's still like looking at the world through a keyhole. Uh, I've got this big screen. Uh, Check out Ingress if you haven't yet. Of uh, real reality. Uh, and uh, we will be online all the time with augmented reality and just used to looking at people and having pop ups tell us who they are and just telling us uh, their name will be very useful. That'll be a killer app. Uh. Hi, so I had a question. Once we have these pattern recognizers in our, um, that we can access remotely, um, obviously the best of breeds will emerge and everyone will start want to copy the best, most accurate, most efficient one. At that point, if I did that, would I still be me? I talk about that in the book. Uh, there are three great philosophical questions, consciousness, uh, free will and identity, and you're asking about the identity issue. And uh, I think, in my view, identity comes from a continuity of pattern, uh, not from the people say, well, no, Ray, you're this physical stuff. You're flesh and blood. That's actually not true. I'm completely different physical stuff than I was six months ago. Um, and I go through that in the book, all these different cells. Uh, die and are recreated. Okay, the neurons persist, but the parts of the neuron, like the tubules and the actin filaments, and all of these turn over, some in five hours, some in five days, and we're completely different stuff uh, a few months later. So we're like a river. You know, uh, Charles River goes by my office. Is that still the same river it was yesterday? It's completely different water. But the pattern 
has a continuity. So we, we call it the same river. So, uh, we are, we're the same thing. Now we can augment that pattern by, say, introducing non-biological parts to it. Uh, and I think it's very clear if that's done in a continuous manner, it's very analogous to what's happening naturally, which is that we're constantly changing the stuff and gradually changing the pattern. But there's a continuity of pattern, and that's the nature of our identity. So I, I talk about that in that, in that, in that chapter. Uh, could you comment on the progress uh, in the field of nanotechnology since you wrote Singularity? And what was the last? Uh, could you just comment on the progress in the field of nanotechnology since you wrote the Singularities here? Um, well, it's been, you know, nanotechnology is a further off revolution than biotechnology. Uh, but there have been uh, advances in our ability to create s small structures which are applying, being applied actually to electronic devices. And electronics is clearly nanotechnology. You know, the, the feature sizes are approaching 20 nanometers, uh, which is like 100 carbon atoms. We're starting to build three-dimensional structures. Uh, so there's uh, definitely been a lot of nanotechnology there. MEMS is become, you know, there are MEMS devices now that are under 100 nanometers because it's using the same technology as semiconductors. And um, there are experiments with uh, devices in the human body. Uh, there are dozens of experiments of uh, blood cell sized devices that are nano engineered uh, doing therapeutic interventions in animals. I think that's a further revolution than the biotech. Biotech is really here is kind of on the experimental cutting edge, like this heart, if you want to fix your heart, if you've had a heart attack, you actually can't, that's not FDA approved. It will be soon, but right now you have to go to Israel or, or Thailand or, uh, so it's kind of on the edge, but it's, it's very close at hand. Uh, nanotechnology is still, you know, I think late 2020s uh, for those types of applications. I hope this doesn't come across as a flaky question, but um, <laughs> no what question are you, are you, in your research, um, have you found uh, the same, you know, love uh, accelerating returns um, in, in happiness, you know, fulfillment, satisfaction? Well, this is actually a similar question to the first one uh, in that our expectations uh, are constantly changing. You know, if you talk to caveman or woman thousands of years ago, they would say, gee, if I could just have a bigger boulder to keep the animals out of my cave and, uh, and prevent this fire from going out, I would be happy. Well, don't you want a better website? And, uh, um, so we don't even know what we want until somebody invents uh, these ideas. Um, and our expectations of what should be uh, are constantly changing. People who are poor today st still generally have access to refrigerators and to, to communications and uh, clothing. Uh, you go back several hundred years ago, uh, even a middle class person only had one shirt uh, before there was automation in the textile industry. And so our expectations of what it takes to be happy change. I think people are happier because a much higher percentage of the population gets part of their satisfaction and definition in life from their work. Uh, not everybody, apparently. I was uh, interested by this French strike where they were very upset of extending their retirement age from 60 to 62. And I thought, gee, these people really must not like their work. Uh, but then I realized that I had retired when I was five because I'm really doing what I love to do. And I think that should be the objective of work. And many more people have the opportunity to do that. Uh, work done in the information sector, people really have a passion for it. Whereas 100 years ago, they were just glad if they could earn a living. Um, but it's a moving frontier. And I think that's a good thing. And that's part of what propels humanity forward, is we're constantly uh, questing for you know, more, uh, and more doesn't necessarily mean greater quantity of, of uh, physical things. It could be just more music and more 
uh, opportunity to have relationships, which social networks gives us the opportunity to do, and so on. So with the uh, increase in knowledge work, it requires a uh, lot of knowledge transfer between humans. Do you envision any efficient methods of knowledge transfer between humans beyond? Could you speak a little louder? I'm missing some words. Do you envision any efficient methods of knowledge transfer between humans, no, unlike reading books or anything, just beaming? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, when we can have massively distributed communication points in our neocortex, it could provide a higher bandwidth way of communicating. But we have to appreciate that it's actually a very challenging translation job from one neocortex to another. I talk about this in the book. If you could actually ex get this information at any bandwidth and even process it quickly uh, of someone else's neocortex, you'd have no idea what it means because that pattern recognizer, say, fires with a high probability, but you can only interpret that based on the ones that are connected to it. And each of those you can only understand by the ones connected to it all the way down the hierarchy, you'd have to actually have a kind of complete dump of most of their neocortex to understand it. Um, and so just, it's not like we would readily understand someone else's neocortex, even if you could transfer that information without translating it. Uh, we have a translation mechanism, which is language. So we could take thoughts from one neocortex, even though it's very different from someone else's, because we've each built this hierarchy, and actually communicate a thought that the other person can understand. That's what language enables us to do. Uh, we could perhaps do some automatic translation, just like we translate languages now from one neocortex to another to provide higher bandwidth connection. I mean, it's something we could speculate once we're able to do that in the 2040s. Um, I didn't, excuse me, so you've already covered this. I was way in the back and it was a little hard to hear you, but the, uh, um, have we are, do we have software engineering stuff to model these um, clusters of neurons and create these models already? Um. Well, the, the closest that we've had uh, is these hierarchical hidden Markov models, which as I mentioned, uh, have become a common technique uh, in AI. Uh, they don't, they're missing certain things and that generally the hierarchy is fixed so, I mean, I began pioneering this in the 80s, and we did it for speech recognition, and we added simple natural language understanding, and we had some fixed levels of uh, spectral features, phonemes, words, and then simple uh, syntactic structures. And, but it was relatively fixed. It could prune some elements, some of these recognizers, uh, if they weren't used but it didn't actually self-organize in terms of creating the connections, which is really the essence of what the neocortex does. If you, get, if you want to get into a better level of natural language understanding, you need to be able to do that because one of the features of language is it it's not, doesn't just have two or three fixed levels of hierarchy. Language reflects the hierarchy of the neocortex. It can have many different uh, levels and you really need to model quite a few, quite a few levels in order to make semantic sense of language. Uh, and we need to be able to dynamically build that hierarchy. But it's interesting actually that I think there's a mathematical similarity between this a hierarchical hidden Markov model technique and what happens in the brain. And it's not because we were emul trying to emulate the brain in the 80s and 90s because we didn't really understand, uh, we didn't have enough information to confirm that that's how the brain works. Uh, it just that technique worked and biological evolution evolved neocortexes that way for the same reason. Um, speaking of assuming that the world will not change a lot, um, I'd like to, to comment on the non-technical aspect of this change. Uh, we all assume that 20 years from now we'll be living in a stable democracy with free market and a capitalist economy those changes that you predict, how much of that are they going to change, politically and economically? Well, I, I do think the distributed communication technologies we have is democratizing. I wrote that in, my, in the 1980s, and then that was discussed in my first book, which I wrote in the 80s. 
uh, I said the Soviet Union would be swept away by the then emerging social network, which was communication over teletype machines and uh, fax machines uh, by these clandestine network of hackers. And uh, so people heavily criticized that. that. At that time, the Soviet Union was a mighty nuclear superpower. It's not going to get swept away by a few teletype machines. But that's exactly what happened in the 1991 coup against Gorbachev. Uh, the authorities grabbed the central TV and radio station, which had always worked in the past because it kept everybody in the dark. But now uh, this clandestine network, this sort of first social network, kept everybody in the know. And it just swept away uh, the, the t totalitarian government. And with the rise of the web, there was a great wave of democratization in the late 90s. Uh, we see the effect of social networks today. It is democratizing for people to share knowledge uh, at that grassroots level, see how other people live and think. Uh, it, it really cr uh, is able to harness the wisdom of crowds rather than the wisdom of a lynch mob. Um, and we've also democratized the tools of creativity. So a kid with a notebook computer could start Facebook and a couple of kids in a late night dorm room challenge started Google and uh, we see now younger kids doing quite dramatic things. Uh, teenagers with, with tools that everybody has, kid in Africa with a smartphone has access to more knowledge than the President of the United States did 15 years ago. Uh, so th these, these are having an impact on our economy, on society. Here's a very dramatic demonstration of the political power of this organized group of people who are able to communicate. Uh, the SOPA legislation was headed for uh, bilateral uh, passage. Both Democrats and Republicans were, were for it. It was going to be passed, one of the few examples where there was agreement on a piece of legislation. Well, uh, users saw that as a threat to the freedom on the web and organized this demonstration. Within hours, it was dead. So, I mean, just think of the tremendous political power that was demonstrated there. Uh, you know, Google participated in that, but suddenly Wikipedia becomes a great political power. It just snaps its fingers. And so, you know, I think that these are very positive phenomena. Um, and it's affecting society, it's affecting communication. Uh, people criticize online education now because it's missing a social component that you have, you know, with a campus. But we can actually do a better job uh, with uh, social networks and social communication online uh, because we overcome the, the geographic barrier. I'm, I'm struggling to find the exact words, sorry. Uh, but I wanted to ask you whether the, you see power uh, not as in electronic power, but power as in control over individuals as something that's exponentially uh, accelerating in terms of the state or security apparatus versus freedom. It seems like both are accelerating quite quickly um, and, and there's this tension between uh, the power that's, uh, of the, that's being centralized versus sort of of the individual. Um, well, you can imagine... You know, these tools can be used to spy and, uh, and uh, wreck privacy, uh, invade privacy. The, uh, the recent scandal going on in Washington raises issues of, you know, the privacy of emails and so on. Um, on the other hand, I, th I think it's also been very democratizing, as I mentioned. Uh, I think it's led to greater freedom. I think that trend has been more pronounced uh, in the, abil the ability of individuals to organize around a set of ideas that they quickly uh, support in terms of freedom. Uh, and we've seen the democratizing effect of, of decentralized electronic communication. Uh, privacy is a very important issue. That's certainly an important issue here. I think Google does a good job of it, but it's something that has to be a high priority. Uh, you know, if any of uh, service like Facebook or something did, did not keep faith with its users in terms of these social issues, uh, there would be a reaction. Uh, so it's, and it raises complicated issues, like privacy it used to be enough to just, 
you know, close the curtains in your bedroom, and now we have a thousand virtual windows on our lives. Uh, nonetheless, I think we're doing pretty well. I, I almost never encounter someone who says, oh, my life was ruined by the loss of privacy uh, because of all these new technologies. Now, maybe those people don't talk to me, but... Uh, <laughs> But I, I think uh, we're doing okay, but you know, it, it is making these uh, once routine issues much more complicated. So uh, when you were talking about the digitization of or the um, information age of manufacturing with uh, printers, 3D printers, I had a question about resources. Like um, if you print with like hydrocarbons, for example, then you might need an oil rig and a ship and a truck to get resources from the earth into the printer and that takes a lot of time and a lot of fuel whereas if you build with plants then you need to farm somewhere and again you need transport to where the printers are so how do you see things changing it's not that many resources you need to to create these physical things by far the most hydrocarbons are used in burning them for fossil fuels uh, yes some of those products are used now in chips for example but it's a very small part of the of the output and if we can actually create the right products at, at the destination in a distributed manner and then also recycle the, these materials, uh, that's a pretty efficient use of, of these materials. Uh, Peter Diamandis has a book called Abundance that deals with, in, in detail, this issue of energy, these kinds of resources for three-dimensional printing, water, food, uh, building materials. And as we adopt new technologies, we actually find that uh, this tremendous abundance of, of resources, like 10,000 times more sunlight that we need to meet all our energy needs. Uh, Larry Page was fond of going a mile or two that way, and there's a lot of heat in the, in the Earth, geothermal energy, which is also thousands of times more than we need. And there are a lot of other scenarios. Uh, so as we find new... Uh, 21st century technologies, we can tap these resources. Uh, there's new water technologies uh, like Cayman's slingshot machine, which, can, which are decentralized and can create clean water very inexpensively. Uh, vertical agriculture to, to grow food in AI-controlled buildings, recycling all the nutrients. So in fact, it would not be the wasteful kind of an ecologically damaging uh, food production techniques we use now. Uh, but we can create food very inexpensively, including in vitro cloned meat. I mean, why grow meat from animals when we only need a small part of the animal? We, we know how to, in fact, grow the muscle tissue, which is what we want. That's been demonstrated. Uh, this can be done in AI-controlled buildings at, at very low cost, ultimately. But do you think that, say, a computer will be able to print, be printed with resources that were sourced locally? Uh, there's actually s some experimental three-dimensional printing systems that can print electronics. Um, being able to actually print electronics in a uh, distributed manner, there are pros and cons to it. Uh, the, an argument can be made, no, print, you know, computation and communication is very universal, so let's have plants that really do that efficiently and then customize it for people with, with software. Uh, that's the model we're using now. I mean, it's remarkable how powerful, you know, a, a computational and communication device you can get for very little money, and that's continuing to improve. I hope you all made some new neocortical connections today, <laughs> which will be useful in your work and in your lives. And please join me in thanking Dr. Kurzweil today. <laughs>